working at the BBC as staff, you're allocated to any job that comes along. But it's perhaps no surprise that I'm joined now by someone who worked with the first three doctors. I would like to introduce makeup designer Sandra XLV. How are you? Uh, yeah, I'm fine, thank you. You've been busy? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm the chairman of the National Association of Screen Makeup Artists and Hairdressers. I don't work anymore, too old and crotchety. Um, but I keep my finger in the pie by looking after new and uh, people coming up through the industry and give, we try and give them all the help and guidance that we can to get into this wonderful career of makeup and hairdressing. So doing that, do you have to look back to when you started off in the industry as well? Then? Yes, yes, we tell them, you know, what it was like early days at the BBC. Um, as I say, as, as a, an assistant in those days, you were allocated uh, a day's work and you went in, you didn't know what you would be working on um, because we did a seven day fortnight in those days. Um, so you'd work Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then the next week you'd, you'd work Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday and Sunday. Um, and sometimes you were two days on a production, but you very rarely saw a script because you were only ever doing the background and bits and pieces. But you were obviously very aware of the, the principal artists on the shoot. So William Hartnell was treated with great reverence and everybody was very polite to him because he was an actor um, of, of, you know, great standing, having come from the theatre and the, the film industry. I think he was one of the first actors to come from film to work in telly, um, but I, I, I won't state that as a fact. Um, but, you know, he was treated very well and we were all quite aware after the first year, I suppose, that this was going to be something that maybe would take off and, and last because the kids absolutely loved it. Watching like this from the back of the sofa um, with the Daleks when they first came in. And then um, just towards the end of my uh, training time, I worked on the first Cybermen um, episodes. Um, and that wasn't very pleasant uh, for either us or the Cybermen because we had um, wind machines going and artificial snow, which were little pellets of polystyrene, which blew in your hair and blew in your eyes and blew up your nose and in your mouth, if you've opened your mouth by mistake. Um, and the Cybermen outfits were very, very uncomfortable because once they were strapped on the, the chest pieces, they couldn't sit down. So we had to get the old leaning boards out that they used to use on period productions for ladies in corsets who couldn't sit down. And we just lent them up against the side wall, against the leaning boards, and asked them if they wanted anything and left them there for a few minutes, bless them. Uh, and off we went while we had a cup of tea. <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant. The ground was uneven, and if they fell over, it took two or three people to help uh, stand them up because it was only a breastplate and a helmet in those days. The the outfits were just a, a stretchy lycra suit with a, a hole cut in it for their mouth and eyes. I don't think they even had nose holes, poor things. <laughs> Health and safety would have gone loony. <laughs> but those were the early days of telly. And for that, the makeup designer was Gillian James. Had you yes. Yes, I, I worked on several things with Gillian. She was a lovely lady. Always looked so very neat and tidy. She had a lovely, uh, perfect persona about her. She always wore a big bow in the back of her hair, tying her hair back so that it didn't fall off all over the artist. She was the <laughs> perfection of the art, of a makeup artist, bless her. And a lovely lady, but um, sadly no longer with us. So who were the, the people that you'd have been learning from at the time? Um, well, there were, were um, I don't know about learning from. Um, I was working alongside people like Penny Bell, um, Penny Delamar, who had her own school, 
for a while. Um, oh, gosh, so many people. Tony Chapman, who was one of the top. Maureen Winslade was one of the top. Tommy Manderson was my head of department for a long time. And Tommy retired early and left and had a glorious film uh, career doing films with Spielberg and people of that sort of note. Um, Pam Meager was another one who also left and, and had a, a wonderful film career after leaving. You know, the very, very well grounded and well experienced makeup people that you were learning from. But again, it, it, you're, you're like a sponge when you're first starting out. You absorb all sorts of things from all sorts of areas. I worked my first job as a senior assistant. I worked um, with one of the top senior ladies at the BBC, Betty Blattner. And most people were frightened of Betty, me included. And we were filming um, Billy Budd, the opera. It was the first time an opera had been filmed in a studio. Normally, we would go to the theatres or the opera house and film it as an outside broadcast. But this time they built the set, the, the ship, in the studios. And um, it was my first day as a senior assistant. And Betty said, well, come with me, Sandra, and uh, I will introduce you to your artist. You're only looking after one uh, singer, and he sings Billy Budd. So he is the lead artist, but you're going to look after him. So we walked into the studio, which part of it was the boardroom, the captain's boardroom on the ship that was lined up with all these gentlemen sat round the table because there were no women in Billy Budd. And at the end of the table was this large, red-headed gentleman. And we walked down to him and she said, Ah, oh, Peter, this is Sandra. She's your makeup artist for this opera. Uh, that all right? Sandra, this is Peter Glossop. How do you do? Whereupon he picked me up, threw me over his shoulder and walked out of the studio with me. He said, put me down, put me down, you'll get your fine, you'll get your fine. He said, well, she said you were mine. <laughs> so... That set Peter and I off on a lovely uh, adventure together. Um, after that, he requested me to do his um, six opera showcase, which we did. And following that, I was made a designer, as is now, uh, to do his version of Rigoletto. So that was my progress into opera. <laughs> but, um, of course, the BBC did all sorts of programmes. Um, I did the original series of Dad's Army, where I helped with, with David Croft and the artists to create the look of those wonderful characters that is now so loved. Um, and, and, you know, you at the time you were just given a, a script. That's your first script of six. You read it and you go along to production meetings and you talk about it and you ring the artists and formulate how they want to look. I became very good friends with um, some of the actors on that. And we stayed friends for a long time, even after I left the BBC. But just before I left the BBC, I was fortunate enough to work with John Pertwee on his first section of his Doctor as Doctor Who which was the Lynx character, which was an alien who landed back in historical times. So I had historical, futuristic and present day. So it was quite a difficult um, four episodes to do. But John Pertwee and I got on very well. And when I left the BBC, he asked me to do Wurzel Gummidge with him, but I wasn't allowed to go and work at Southern Television because they have their own people. <laughs> how you progressed at the BBC you worked you were lucky enough to work with an actor or an actress uh, on a few things and you became reasonably close friends and when you left they rang you up and said would you like to come and be my personal on things as many makeup artists and hairdressers have done since and you mentioned uh, well, 
John Pertwee and Lynx of Sontara. Yes. It was a story that all of the sort of natives at the time had wigs and beard, people like David Dacre. So that yes. must have been demanding in itself, let alone the Sontara and then everything that went with it. Oh, yes. Well, as I say, I had, I had a period production to do, a futuristic with the Sontaran, because we had to make his hands, so we made his hands like Live Long and Prosper, um, which were early days. We were quite forward in that. Uh, and the head was made by our special effects department. And it was like a utility head made to fit anybody. And it didn't really fit the poor actor who had to wear it. Um, and But we were lucky because the costume had the same shape as his spaceship, the sort of golf ball look, and he was like a little frog person inside. Um, so he didn't have to wear the head when he had the helmet on. So that was fortunate because it was very claustrophobic in there for him. But yes, David Dacre and all that lot running around in their beards and moustaches had to be watched closely. And then some tarans in helmets and not to mention John Pertwee and of course Liz Sladen. It was her first episode. And the director said to me, I want her to have a specific haircut. He said, because I want her to, if she rolls over or she falls or we have to hang her upside down, I want her to twist her head and it falls back into shell. Oh, you don't want much then, do you? But, but I took her off somewhere madly expensive and she had a beautiful haircut. So that was, uh, that worked out all right. <laughs> but then I left the BBC after those uh, four episodes in the studio. We did filming. And then we had four episodes in the studio to shoot. And then I went on to do Bogsy Malone. I worked as an assistant hairdresser to Sarah Manzani on Bogsy Malone with all those nobody under 15, I mean over 15 on the shoot. Lots and lots of children who were beautifully behaved. We had a very good second AD, Brian Bilgory, who ruled them with a rod of iron. <laughs> And uh, if they wanted to, they, all the little girl dancers were in the same hotel near Pinewood Studios. And if they wanted to go swimming in the hotel swimming pool, they had to come and check with makeup and hair before they went swimming. Because if they were going to go swimming, they had to have their hair set and go home in curlers and hair nets. So that when they came in the next morning, all we had to do was a comb out and push into shape and spray um, because we weren't allowed to have them in before 8.30 in the morning and they had to be out of the studio gates by six o'clock at night. But it was a 12 week schedule and we finished at six o'clock on the last day of the 12th week. So we managed it somehow. But it was hard work. We, uh, Sarah and I, we worked out. We the how many jars of brill cream we used <laughs> uh, because all the little boys had brill cream through their hair to get that beautiful slick shiny hairdo and um we were using an awful lot of shampoo to get rid of it and so sarah ran brill cream and said how do we get rid of it and he said put the shampoo straight onto the dry hair massage it in he said it goes vile like cream jelly but when you wash it off and put shampoo onto the hair all the grease will have gone and it did so we saved the production a lot of shampoo <laughs> but we thought we set a new trend because um we we had them all with this lovely short back and sides and dexter fletcher came in who is now a very famous director uh, to play a character, a little character. And uh, he was meant to be an ex-convict. So Sarah did this quite severe crew cut on him. And his mother, his mother went mad. And she came in and she said, I can't send him to school looking like this. You, you've got to give him a wig so he can go to school. And Dex, I don't want, I don't want a wig. Yes, you're having a wig. So we gave him a wig and the wig was used as a football mount around the playground most of the time because he wouldn't bear it um but uh, you know little things like that and now you see him as this famous director 
on movies and you think, oh, God, he cried when we cut his hair. <laughs> so how was that initial transition from the BBC to freelancing and going on to films? Was that quite an easy move? Uh, it was insofar as that people knew my name. So when I left the BBC, I contacted most of the television companies and said, I'm now freelance if you need daily work or whatever. So I worked uh, on a lot of television things at first when I left. I did, there was a, almost a year of shooting on Shakespeare that ATV did. I worked on a lot of that. And then I was lucky enough to get two or three little tiny films, B feature films that they used to do in those days. Um, so I started moving into film and then Bugsy Malone was my first big feature that I worked on. But it was fun and we, we had the music from day one of the shoot so we all knew the songs and we all sang the songs. But the, the custard pie sequence at the end that took four days to shoot, um, we shot the master of that with six cameras. And we just said to the kids, go Barbie, throw them where you want. And then over the next three days, we did the cut-ins and the close-ups and the pies hitting the face. But of course, by then, all the costumes and everything were covered in confectioner's cream that we used. We didn't use the usual shaving foam that they used because it was horrid. If the kids got it in their mouth, it was horrid. So we used confectioner's cream, which after two or three days is a bit rancid and horrid but we used to have to go around with buckets of the stuff and slap it on again and slap it on the costumes and on their hair and bits and pieces but, but they got their revenge like they got Alan Parker one day coming back from lunch they caught him round the back of the set and he walked on the set and he looked like a snowman he was covered from head to, head to foot and a lot of us would walk around the corner and get splot, you know, we'd get one. But, you know, what do you expect? They were all kids and all having a lovely time. Um, Jodie Foster wanted to go home covered in it all one day. And we said, you know, the driver won't let you get in the limo to go back to the hotel covered in confectioner's cream. It'll ruin the interior. He said, oh, but I want to show my mum. We'll, we'll, take, we'll take a Polaroid, you can show her that. But she had to have her hair washed and her face all cleaned off before she went back to the hotel. But they were kids. They were 15 year olds, the oldest, you know. And it was great fun, but a bit smelly by the end of four days. <laughs> Another sort of big film you worked on was Highlander, which I suppose had a very different set of challenges, I imagine. Yes. Um, well, Highlander had started shooting. And... Um, the, the, I don't know if you know the story, but Highlander does not age. He's immortal. And in the original part of the story, he meets this girl in the Scottish Highlands and falls in love. So we have to shoot the scene where she ages. And they shot it first with Nick Maley doing a full prosthetic makeup on her. And Russell Mulcahy, the director, said, no, 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 that, that, that's not what I want. I don't recognise her. He said, in the previous scene, we have seen her walking up over a hill carrying a lamb. And she's young and the hair's blowing in the wind and she's beautiful. The next shot, to show a passage of time, she's going to walk up over the hill again, carrying a lamb. And then we notice the hair is grey and the face is wrinkled. And the eyes are milky when we get into close up. And I don't want it to be that obvious at first. So Nick Maley said, well, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I can't do that. And his second in command, Bob Keane, uh, knew me quite well. We were friends. And he phoned up and said, would you come in and do um, a special aging on BT Edney? And I said, yeah, yeah OK tell me what it's about and what the director wanted. So I went in and we had a, a, a thing that we used to use called old age stipple, 
which was a latex based product, which you painted onto the skin with the skin stretched, dried it with a hairdryer, and when you released it, the skin wrinkled up with the latex. And we did a full facial old age makeup on her and her hands. And we showed the director and the director was very happy. So the next day I went in and we did it for the shoot. And there were big close ups, not many, which I thought was a shame because she did still look quite beautiful. But she had these lovely soft wrinkles and these milky contact lenses in. Anyway, the special effects supervisor, Nick Maley, then said, well, I'm leaving the picture. So he left the picture. Bob Keane took over and Bob Keane said, we have this one character who has a full prosthetic head, makeup, uh, tribal scarring, uh, tattooing. He's airbrushed um, and he has a slit throat with um, safety pins. So <laughs> said, just a little makeup. He said, yes, uh, come and watch one of the makeup artists do it once and then you can take over. So I took over a four hour makeup on Clancy Brown, um, which in, uh, started off with winding his own hair out of the way, placing this full head on and sticking it down, including down the back of his neck so that you got good tension when he turned. And then we had new edge pieces every day on top of that. Then he was airbrushed. Um, the head had a tattoo on the side of a dragon with a long hair tail hanging out, but that was already done on the basic head, which we had to put together every five or six times. But at least we had the head we could use five times before we had to do a new one. Um, he had tribal scars around here. And then we hand sculpted the slit throat and just pushed the, um, the safety pins into the sculpting gel around his neck. And then at the end of the day, it took us an hour to take it off, <laughs> which was annoying because Clancy wanted to get off and go and have a sleep or go and play bowls or, you know, do something. Um, but we ended up doing that 56 of days shooting. So it was quite a lot, including two weeks in New York, night shooting. <laughs> didn't see a lot of New York apart from the skyline yeah. apart from Lois Burwell and I had one day one weekend day off and we went shopping like whirling dervishes with our card <laughs> coming back with lots of New York goodies but um, again that, that, we, I was very very pleased with that it, it was early prosthetic days we hadn't got, we hadn't mastered silicon in those days. It was still foam rubber and, and very hard to get rid of edges and things. But Clancy Brown, well, you had to make it fun because it was four hours. You know, the guy is six foot two tall. And, you know, to sit for four hours in a makeup chair is very uncomfortable. So we used to take a break every hour so we could stand up and have a coffee or use the loo or whatever. And uh, I'd say, right, pot three next, and he'd open the pot and have it there for me. Right, pot four, please. Yes, airbrush next, and he'd pick. So we had to make it fun, and then he'd bring cassettes in of different artists, and I had to guess who the artists were singing. Uh, and I brought tapes in as well. So we had to make it fun, because otherwise it would have been four hours of agony. And uh, once we were on the set and he was working, if I wanted to go in and check, I always had to try and catch his eye. Because if I went in and tried to check his makeup, everything was still in place. He used to growl at me. And this... Because <laughs> I used to have to reach up like this to, to, to reach him. Because he had built up boots as the character, the Kurgan. Plus he had a huge helmet on with flying hair out the top of it no 
it was a wonderful costume covered in chains and leather and quite magnificent costume. So was that perhaps one of the most challenging jobs you've done? Uh, yes, uh, in a way, yes, it was, because it was very hard work and very concentrated work for those four hours. Um, but it was enjoyable and, and I was very pleased with it. Um, one of the last things I did was um, a production in Egypt uh, telling the story of um, a certain period in Egyptian history, modern history. And the writer was also the star and the director and the producer, all in one. But he had 15 different characters to play. Um, the pieces were originally made by an American makeup artist who, once 9-11 took place, refused to go to a Middle Eastern country. So everything was sent out to Egypt uh, again via Sarah Manzani. Sarah phoned me and said, would you be free to do a big prosthetic job in Egypt? And I said, well, give me the details, let me. So off I went with an assistant to Egypt. It took us five days to sort all the pieces out because they were all just thrown in plastic boxes. Nothing was labelled. Um, so we had to work it out from a list of what each character looked like, what each piece was. And we sent somebody out to go and buy more plastic boxes and we labelled them all up and sorted our makeup room out. Um, but that was, was quite a challenge as well in that heat. Then part of the shooting time, we were out there for 16 weeks, um, fell Ramadan. So, of course, they couldn't work during the day because they were all asleep. Um, because that's how they got through Ramadan, they slept. <laughs> and then they got up at half past five and ate a huge meal and then came into work and worked all night and ate another huge meal at half past four as the sun came up before they went home and slept again. Um, but we got through it. And, and he, they, again, because he was the producer and the director and everything else, they were constantly knocking on the makeup room door and his head would turn like this and there's me there with you know, fine sculpting tools near the eyes, not a good idea. So I, I said to him, look, you must tell them if they wanted to come in, they must knock on the door and we will tell them when it's safe, when we've moved away from the danger zone of poking something in your eye or cutting you with something, that they can come in and ask you a question. But the more, than, the more they do that, the longer it's going to take for us to get you out on set. And eventually they learnt and they'd knock on the door. And mainly it was because him asking because he wanted another coffee to keep him away. Oh, oh. Don't, don't fall asleep in the chair. <laughs> but again, they were all two and three hour makeups. Because I had an assistant with me, um, my assistant, Mike Lockie, did one side of his face and I did the others. So we got it done in half the time because we split the face. So, uh, but it was fun. Uh, I'd never been to Egypt. I fell in love with country. Brilliant. Um, we went to Luxor. We filmed at Luxor. And we um, we went. We even went to. Um, oh gosh, I forgot the name of the city we went to. But um, we went all over the place in Egypt, and it was fascinating. But we had to be careful, you know. Don't sit on the floor in the hotel. You sit on the chair, you know, certain rules, don't go out alone and all of this, um, which you think oh, was a bit frightening, but we, it was enjoyable because I, I then had to go back for another four weeks um, after Christmas uh, and M M Mike Lockie couldn't come with me on that one. He was on another production. I had to take a girl out with me. So I had to es explain everything to her so that she didn't. Um, go against protocol. You have to be very careful in, in Muslim countries that you don't offend. And we, you know, we don't, we don't do it deliberately. But because we're so free in this country, if you go to foreign countries, you have to be very aware of their 
you know, their religious beliefs and, and other things. Protocol is very important. That's why you have good um, location managers. <laughs> to get us out of the shit. <laughs> when you've done something diabolical. <laughs> like filming in India. I was in India for 12 weeks on far pavilions. And one of the stunt people uh, got annoyed with one of the Indians who was looking after his horse. Because instead of tying the horse up at the, at the place, he stood holding the horse for an hour and was very rude to the stuntman when he came back and the stuntman hit him. Um, and they were going to <laughs> lynch him virtually. <laughs> he had to stand and apologise in front of the whole Indian crew and get on a plane and swap with another stuntman coming out. And uh, for the next few days, they kept doing silly things like unplugging our generators so that all the lights would go out because we were filming in a, a little cloister place and we had a, a mirror, you know, with lights round uh, and we, we needed the electricity. And I was making up... Um, one of the knights of the realm <laughs> um, and the lights kept going out and I kept saying, oh, awfully sorry, I said, it's your magnetism, you see, <laughs> make some excuse, wait for 10 minutes while they plugged it all back in and got it going again and uh, it happened two or three times and in the end he said, my God, Sandra, it's like Caritas Interrupters, <laughs> which gave us all a laugh, bless him. <laughs> but you know we used to have so much more fun on filming um, until Elf and Safety took over <laughs> one job that I hope was a lot of fun to do was working alongside Morecambe and Wise which you did an awful lot of yes I worked for a year with Morecambe and Wise it started off with the Christmas show with uh, Glenda Jackson playing dancing as Ginger Rogers, um, Andrew Preview, and the famous I'm playing all the right notes but not necessarily in the right order. <laughs> um, and then I did 11 more monthly shows um, and then I had to go on to something else. I was going to do something else but it was great fun working with them. They used to do their own warm-up with this terrible ventriloquist dummy thing that they used to do. Oh, dreadful. And Eric used to be so naughty because I'd say, you know, we're about to record. Can I just please say, no, yeah, yeah, you go to makeup. If I'm not there in five minutes, start without me. And awful things like that in front of the audience, <laughs> which you just, you just had to accept. I was, I was on the shoot where... Um, Again, that, I think it was the first Christmas show where Shirley Bassey came on and she did Smoke Gets In Your Eyes where she come, goes around the turntable and her shoe comes off and they put her a boot on her foot and all of that. And at first we were all laughing, you know, behind camera. And she looked over at her husband and I thought, oh, she's going to go because she could be touchy in those days. Bless her. And he was laughing. He said, that is so funny. And they're not laughing at you, darling. They're laughing at what they're doing to you. So she accepted it. So anyway, she was then going to do her solo number. And she had on this magnificent dress, which was just covered in Swarovski crystals. She looked fabulous. And Eric came on. Oh, God, Shirley said, you look fabulous. You look just like a Brillo pad. And we all went, oh, no. But thank God she got his sense of humour by then, and so she laughed. But um, he could be touchy, could be touchy. It was one of the few um, rehearsal studios, when we were rehearsing in the studios, in the sets, that it was an open studio. Anybody could go in and watch because it helped them get the timing for when the audience would laugh. We were never told to be quiet. We were told to laugh when you wanted to, you know. Uh, and if he didn't get the laughs um, when he thought they should come, he used to get quite touchy. But it was 
the laughter was a lifeblood to them. You know what I mean? So with they're all comedians. If they're not getting the laugh, that's what they live for. But um, no, I enjoyed working with them for a year. I'd, I'd had enough by the end of the year, I think. <laughs> um, but I, I, we actually went, fi we went filming uh, for one of their sketches where they played World, World War II pilots and they had their scarves wired so they fluttered all the time. And Eric had these jodhpurs made with his youth outside panels in his jodhpurs. But um, I know it was fun and it's always good to laugh. Does you good to laugh, doesn't it? Uh, always, always, certainly does. Yeah. So in your capacity now as the chairman of, of NASHMA, what sort of advice would you give someone starting out today in the industry, do you think? You have to look at a career in makeup and hairdressing as a ladder. You can't start at the top of the ladder because the only place you can go is down. You start at the bottom, get a really good training. Don't take on any job that you know you can't do because you just make yourself look foolish. Say no, but next time you want somebody, I will know how to do that. And then slowly work up that ladder and then you will get to the top and you'll be doing the wonderful films that they're doing now with wonderful artists. It's such a privilege working with some of these actors and actresses. Um, again, when we were in India, uh, Omar Sharif was in it and in one of the scenes I just stood there and I just knew how privileged I was to watch that performance. All right, it's recorded on film, but to actually see it, it is, it is a privilege to do makeup and hair. Uh, but you must train and get the best training possible because you're asked to do the most outrageous things <laughs> and you really have to think outside the box. Well, on, on that note, and I think you know, it's clear you, you loved your time, not only at the BBC, but also as a freelancer. I just like to say thank you very much for your time, Sandra. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I've thoroughly enjoyed every minute of it, every hour of it. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. <laughs>